What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Behind the Facade. I am your host, Gavin J. Gallagher, and on this podcast, I explore the mental and emotional game, often playing out subconsciously, both in your mind and the mind of everyone else in the real estate or property investment market. The key to success in this game is to master your mindset and behavior, to take control of your thoughts, your emotions, and most importantly, your ego. Welcome to the show. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Behind the Facade. And this week's podcast is actually sponsored by my very own Elite Property Accelerator. As you know, if you were listening last week, I have just launched a new beginner's course. It's kicking off on the 1st of June. And if you want to go there and check it out, if you're interested at all, there is currently an early bird offer that um, is, you know, it's it's there until the 1st. And it just gives you a couple of extra goodies that you won't get after the 1st of June. So go check it out. You'll see a link in the show notes below. And with that, let's get on with the episode. Now, this week, believe it or not, I had a completely different episode planned. Episode 159 was going to be my response to a listener request that we had. And um, a listener based in the UK, Lubomir, Lubo, and uh, Lubo asked if I would be able to do uh, an episode on Dubai property. And uh, thank you, Lubomir. I, <laughs> I actually remember meeting you. I met you in 2020. It's hard to believe that just before this podcast began, I met you at the London Commercial Property Summit. And so it's nice to be able to respond to your request. So pr- Dubai property, yes, do proper, Dubai property is something I do know something about. I lived there for about three years, but it was way back in 2010, 2011, 2012, just after the crash, the 2008 crash. And I went off looking for basically projects to kind of get my teeth into that could help me keep the show on the road. Uh, So I built a large, I was involved in a project building a large office building in a place called downtown Dubai. And that is a building that is occupied today by Standard Chartered Bank. Big, big building. And it was great to be involved in that project. But the reality is, you know, that's now a little more than 10 years ago. And so all I have are stories that go back a little over 10 years. And so I don't have new, up-to-date information. I don't have information that would be useful to you if you are trying to, you know, go there and start, you know, either getting involved in the property world as an agent or becoming an investor or, you know, putting deals together, whatever it might be that you have in mind. However, what I do have, and this is uh, kind of what I'm getting to here, is I have an old school pal, a guy I grew up with, We went to school together, went to the same school and probably spent like 12, 13 years in that school together. And he moved out to Dubai eight years ago and he has been working as an agent on new developments, selling homes, all that kind of stuff for the last eight years. And he's very, very high up in the organization that he is that he is in. Uh, they do a lot of new developments, as I mentioned. So he ha- has basically a finger on the pulse. He knows what's going on, where all the deals are, um, you know, all the connections, how it all works. And it's just, I had a great conversation with Finton. And we were talking about all of the stuff going on in Dubai. We talked about everything. I mean, Dubai is just incredible. And this is one of the biggest, what's really, really interesting is when you compare, say, the Irish market that I'm familiar with now with the Dubai market that I was familiar with 10 years ago. You've got a place that probably wants to build or needs to build the same number of residential units over the next 10 years. The difference is it will achieve that number. We will not. Um, Ireland will not be able to achieve the numbers that it requires. Dubai will. And why is that? Well, it boils down to, well, a lot of reasons, but I would say probably the biggest one is that Ireland has got a democratically elected government. And so it's all about the election cycle. Make sure that you get voted in again and, you know, don't upset people. Make sure that you're doing what you can do. 
versus uh, an, uh, a monarch or a ruler. And when a ruler is there, if he is, you know, if he has a vision, now the, the ruler of Dubai has incredible vision. That's one of the biggest things that the guy has going from. And he looks at things, you know, in a big way and he sees massive opportunity and he just goes for it. And he looks, he's looking ahead 10, 20, 30 years and he's able to put the stuff into place 10, 20, 30 years away. Now we can, as a, you know, we can talk about that as, you know, planning and things that we can say, okay, our planning department are looking ahead, you know, six years and 20 years, you know, they might have some sort of an idea for 20 years out. But the reality is, is none of the politicians are thinking that far ahead. They're thinking next election cycle. And so none of the things that need to be done to kind of really move mountains and make stuff happen are going to get done when you're focused on an election cycle. Anyway, I'm kind of going off topic here, but a lot of what I talked about with Finton was all about the fact that the stuff that I saw 10 years ago when I was there and the stuff that would have put me off investing in Dubai, you know, certain issues about ownership of companies, things like that, all of that has been addressed. It is now much, much different place to the one I lived in 10 years ago. Much, much better as an investor, all of that stuff. And um, anyway, I'm going to le- let that conversation with Finton play out. But it's not going to play out today. And why is that? Because as I was finishing the conversation with Finton, I looked down at my recorder and I realized this conversation has not been recorded. I had just updated my Zoom settings and (laughs) it was just the most frustrating moment when you realize that you've just spent an hour chatting with somebody. Great episode all of the stuff that Lubo was asking about answered and no recording of it. So rookie mistake, uh, I apologize. And what I have to do now is basically get Finton to come back and we'll go through it again. Now it'll probably make for a better episode because I actually know now some of the questions to really drill into and focus on, but you're going to have to wait for that. And what I'm hoping is that it'll be maybe next week Um, But it's really down to Finton finding the time in his busy schedule. So keep an eye out for that one. That is going to be coming soon. I feel like I felt like such an idiot, I have to say, as you can well imagine. But um, anyway, what we're going to do today is we're going to cover. I'm I'm on the back foot. I don't have a topic that I've prepared for really, really well. However, on Saturday, I went for a big, big, long run. I was gone for nearly two hours on this run. And during that run, I was listening to a guy talking about procrastination. And procrastination, the guy's name is Tim Pitchell, by the way. And procrastination is a problem that I think probably everybody deals with. And I include myself in that group. So this guy, Tim Pitchell, he's an expert and he's like a a science or he's He's uh, some sort of a university professor in Harvard or Stanford or something like that. And he was explaining the entire way it works and the studies that they've done and all that. as really, really powerful listening to that because I came out of it with all of this clarity around what's happening when I am finding myself procrastinating. And I'm sure you guys, if you suffer from it at all, you will know what I'm talking about. And so you'll find today's uh, impromptu topic that I've had to bring up at the last minute. You'll find it pretty useful, uh, I'm sure. So let's get into it. First of all, we'll begin with a, a definition of what is procrastination. So procrastination is the voluntary delay of a task or action, even though we know that we will be the worse off for that delay. Now, so it it seems counterintuitive, like why would you delay doing something that you know will make you worse off, yet you still go ahead and do it? And so that is the fundamental question. Like, why do we do this? Even though we know it's not good for us, why do we go ahead and do it? And what he has found is that procrastination is fundamentally a short-term mood repair. And what it is, though, 
I mean, it seems like you're you're fixing your mood, but actually what it is, is it, it is quite self-destructive behavior uh, because you pay a price later. But not only that, procrastination triggers guilt. And this explains why people who procrastinate will often pick up some other task and start doing it. And this is their way of distracting themselves from that feeling of guilt. So let's say you're supposed to start some sort of big paper or something like that. And instead of sitting down and getting started on the paper, you decide, oh, I better go and, you know, put the washing on, or I better go and make my lunch for tomorrow, or I better go and start, you know, filing my digital files in the server or whatever. This stuff comes out and it is it's in your mind it's easier to do and therefore it's more pleasant but you don't you're not looking for you're not looking to go and just sit down and watch tv because sitting down watching tv would not alleviate the guilt the guilt is being alleviated by you picking up some other task just not the one that you don't feel like doing right now so it's important to understand you know guilt is one of the emotions that is triggered by procrastination but it's important to kind of remember or to even realize that chronic long-term procrastination, what that actually leads to is shame. And people will find that they become uh, a little bit depressed and stuff because they start to identify themselves as this person who never gets anything done. And so that leads to kind of self, you know, self-hatred and shame, shame of your behavior, shame of why you don't kind of do anything and um, so it's it's quite a bad thing obviously emotionally to feel that way on a long-term chronic basis and so definitely you want to try to address it so let's just get into why do we actually do it like you know we understand now it's mood it's 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 kind of a mood uh, repair thing but what is actually under happening underneath well what we often do there's two things going on the first thing is we almost always overestimate how awful the task is going to be. And so the task that you're avoiding right now, it is. it seems like, oh God, I can't stand the idea of having to do that. Or it's really stressful, or this is going to be awful. And this is what builds up in your mind. And so you come up with all of these things in your mind that, this is really going to be such an unpleasant task. I'm not ready to do it right now. That's what happens in your mind. Now, the reality is it is never as bad as you imagine. But that's what you're feeling at the moment. Now, the other thing that is happening is that you are overestimating the feeling, the, 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 the good feeling that you're going to have from the avoidance of the task in the first place. So you've decided that that's an awful task. I don't want to do that right now. And you feel that your mood will now be improved by, you know, going and doing this other thing, you know, picking up your, your socks and organizing your sock drawer or whatever it is. And that is the distraction from the guilt thing. But what, what's actually happened is that is guilt. The reason you're doing this other thing is to distract you from the guilt. So the fact that you have the fact that you have decided not to do it in the first place and that you'll feel good avoiding this task is not actually what happens. You don't feel good. You feel the guilt. Hence, you choose this other thing to distract you. Now, let's get into how do you overcome procrastination? And I mean, this the short answer is you better regulate your emotions. But, you know, there's actually seven steps that this guy outlined, and I'm going to go through them. Uh, first thing to point out is that procrastination is a brain state. It is not a character flaw. So one of the things you've got to remember is that this is a short-term thing that's happening in your brain right now. This is not something that you create uh, a whole sort of narrative around it or a story that I'm a terrible procrastinator. Don't self-identify yourself as that. This is simply a state of your brain and with a little bit of adjustment of your behavior, you may be able to overcome this quite easily. Let me explain. So what's happening in procrastination, if you go into kind of the brain level of what's actually happening, there is a part of the brain called the amygdala. Now, a lot of you may have heard of the amygdala because it had, it's something I've talked about before. And I talked about it 
in the situation around cognitive bias and stuff. And we talked about how the amygdala is this part of the brain that comes very, very, that was developed millions of years ago, back before we were humans. This part of the brain was developed. And it is a part of the brain that is the flight or fight uh, emotion. So you're walking along, you're a caveman walking along, you hear a rustle in the bushes. Maybe it's a bear or a tiger or whatever it is. Your pump, your blood starts pumping and your muscles start to sort of tighten up and you are ready to go into a full out either sprint or a wrestle this thing to the ground and try to kill it and eat it for dinner or whatever. This is, you know, biology, basically. It's our brain. The amygdala is your fear motivation center. And it triggers this release of um, hormones. And those hormones, they basically hijack the brain. And what happens in, uh, you know, in a situation where, say, a load of guys, you know, jump on you in town, you have a moment where you can either decide, okay, I can take these guys and you kind of like you muscle up and you're kind of ready to kind of start fighting or in that moment you can just say i'm out of here and you leg it and you can you know you're running faster than you've ever ran before that is the moment that that decision it's the fight or flight and that happens in a split second because the amygdala is designed for that reaction now if you've ever had a scary experience like i was thinking about this earlier as i was preparing and i was thinking I remember driving the car in Spain and I was driving on a motorway quite fast and I was close enough to the car in front and whatever happened, the car in front hit the brakes. And I can remember I was looking down at the radio and I looked up and I see this car like braking hard and I'm about to go smash into the back of it. And I swerved out of the way and in like millimeters missed sort of a a rear end on the motorway at high speed. So very, very frightening moment. And I can remember after that happened, heart is pounding out of your chest and like you're actually, your shoulders, your, your everything is tensed up like in a big way. This is the fear response. This is the amygdala sending all those hormones shooting down into your body and you feel this incredible fear and this is how you react to it. So my reaction to kind of spin the, you know, out of there as fast as possible, that was all because of the amygdala, fear response and all that. Now, the problem is afterwards, the milliseconds later, you now have to deal with the fact that all of this muscle tension sort of has come on and you're breathing really heavily and your heart's beating hard. Now, the problem is because procrastination also is centered in the amygdala, What actually happens when you're sitting there looking at a task and thinking, I don't really feel like doing this task, even though it's not, you know, a dangerous moment, the emotions are being interfered with, we'll say, by the amygdala. And so even though this is not a, you know, a a life-threatening situation, it's triggering a similar biological response. And now it's obviously not as extreme or dramatic but what, you're, what is happening when you're in the process of avoiding a task or, you know, procrastinating, you're looking at it, you're thinking, oh, this is going to be a nightmare to do. That is now triggering a mild version of my car reaction. And what it's doing is my heart is starting, my breathing is starting to kind of increase and my muscles are starting to tighten up. Now, not to the same extent that you would notice it the way you do do in a in a you know in a scary moment situation but it is sort of subtly doing this to your body and so that is creating enough of that emotion that you actually get into hesitation and avoidance and so i talked about legging it from those guys that's the hesitation and avoidance you don't feel like having a fight so you run for it well you're doing the exact same thing in this situation you don't feel like doing this task and so hesitation and avoidance is the result. Really interesting, I found. Now, look, there is seven steps that they talk about, and they called it the art. The and they, when they said it was, it was the activate. Uh, what is it? The re- activation response triggers, or something like that. Anyway, I, I've I've messed this one up. I should have prepared better. Um, I want to go through the seven points, though. How to overcome 
procrastination when you realize that this is happening. The first thing to do when you don't want to do a task is to take a moment to just sit back and relax for a moment and try to remember that the muscles and the breathing, those subtle changes in your body are something that you need to address right now. Even though you might not be aware that it's happened, this is something that you need to address. So the first thing to do is to actively relax your muscles. And the way to do that is just to sit down on the chair and just kind of maybe close your eyes. This is a little bit like meditation, which I've been talking about lately. And just breathing, breathing in and out slowly and just do it for a minute or two. And just in regulating your breathing and relaxing your body like that, that will bring down that sort of feeling, uh, that emotion, which is an important first thing. Now, that's step one and two. So step one, actively relax your muscles. Step two, breathe. Step three is try to observe what is happening in an objective, non-judgmental way. Now, this is another thing that you might have heard me lately talking a lot about meditation. And if you're not, if you don't, if you're not into meditation, then you're probably not going to get this. But as I've grown more um, used to it and, I, and I've done it almost, in fact, I think I'm getting very close to exactly one year of not missing a single day of meditation. And the reason that I do it is because it allows you to have these moments of clarity where you're able to actually observe emotions objectively. So you kind of come down for breakfast and you're tired, you didn't get enough sleep and you're kind of like, I'm angry, okay? When you meditate, you can actually recognize and you say, you know what, I am angry and it is because I didn't get enough sleep. And just recognizing it objectively allows you to switch it off. And you can basically say, you know what, uh, there's no reason for me to be angry and therefore I'm just choosing not to be angry anymore. And like, just like that, you can switch it off. Now, in the same way with procrastination, if you can observe what's happening and you can see and you can say, you know what's happening here? This is procrastination. This is exactly, I have probably overestimated how unpleasant this task is. And I know that I don't want to feel the guilt that I'm going to feel. And therefore, you're maybe able to start to overcome this. Now, that's the first thing. Remove the emotion from it and do not identify with it, whatever you do. A lot of people, they'll be like, oh, I'm a terrible procrastinator. And, you know, that's the excuse. And you just kind of move on and avoid the task. Don't avoid the task. Awareness does help a lot. Second of all, number four is to accept and be tolerant of it. Now, this is normal behavior. The thing to remind yourself of is that procrastination, everybody does it and it's normal. Now, if you're a chronic procrastinator, then obviously you have an issue that you want to deal with. But the reality is, is that this is normal behavior. So it's not permanent and therefore do not beat yourself up over it. And don't, just don't, there's no need to beat yourself up. Just non-judgmental, get on with it, go back to the task at hand. Now, number five is obviously you've been tolerant, that's all good, but that is not an excuse for inaction, okay? So just because you're, you're, you know, you're being forgiving and accepting and tolerant of yourself does not mean that you can now just say, okay, I'll move on, I'll do it another day. What you need to do is you've identified it now and you know that it is an emotional state and now's the time to try to tackle it. Now, picture, one of the ways to do that is to picture a, a bright moment in the future when the task is actually being done. So the task is behind you and you can kind of pat yourself on the back of having a good job. That is often a good way to just sort of visualize the task being done. And then you kind of think, oh, wouldn't it be great to actually get this behind me? And then you get on with it. It's a little bit like doing homework as a kid. Like I avoided homework like crazy. And it was always like way, way late at night when I was tired and stuff like that, that I had to kind of get the homework out. And some of my friends, their parents would make them do it at exactly three o'clock or whatever. So the first thing they did, do your homework. Once it's done, they have the rest of the day to kind of enjoy themselves. And it's a much nicer way to be. So try to picture it in the same way. This task will be done. It'll be gone out of my hair and I'll be able to celebrate. Another strategy, just 
while we're on that topic is try the three minute rule. The three minute rule is basically a thing where you say, once I'm going to try this, I'm going to start the task, I'm going to spend three minutes at it. And so all you're doing is promising yourself three minutes. But at the end of three minutes, what you'll probably find is that because you've started it, now you can actually just continue going. Sometimes it's simply that the, 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 the starting of the task is enough to get you going and, and, and you, you carry on and, you're, and you finish it out. Now, going back to uh, point number six, what you've got to go back to is those initial feelings that you identified before. And you've identified in a non-judgmental, objective way that this is procrastination. But what you want to do now is reflect on that and try to understand what was it that caused me to feel the way I did? Um, you know, was it the length of the paper that I have to write or was it the fact that I don't want to, you know, have this confrontation with whatever, you know, whatever it might be that you're avoiding. Try to identify what it is that you're avoiding and try to understand, like, was it really as bad as I thought? And the, one of the reasons why you want to do this is that if it happens again in the future, you will now have that moment of reflection where you said, hold on a sec, this happened the last time and I got through it and it was all you know, it was all a big fuss about nothing. And therefore, I remember that for the future. And then number seven, modification of the negative emotions. So once you've managed to sort of identify what triggers it, you can start to modify those emotions. And once, you, once you're able to spot that stuff early, you become basically a master of your own mindset. Now, final point on this is present day self versus future self. And um, there's a, you know, there's a funny reference to Homer Simpson and he kind of talks about Marge talking to him because he's, he's avoiding hanging out with the kids. And um, she's sort of saying, don't you think, you, you know, you'll regret it at some point in the future if you don't spend more time with your kids? And Homer answers, well, you know, that's a problem for future Homer. I don't need to deal with that right now. But boy, I, I, I don't envy future Homer. <laughs> and so that is the kind of way that we think about things. We, there's a future person that you are and there's your current person you are. And if you think about yourself in current terms, you'll always choose the easy task. But if you think about yourself at some point in the future, then you might tackle the stuff that you know is good for you in the future. And this could be anything from like going for the run, getting healthy, whatever it is, eating healthy food, all of this stuff. If you have a, an image of the future person that you want to be rather than the current person you are, that can often help. And this is not just my, you know, my theory. This is actually something that he was talking about in this thing I was listening to. It was, there was an experiment done. I'm not sure it was at Harvard or somewhere like that, but what they what they did was they got two groups of people. They had the control group and then they had the experiment group. And what they did was they they grouped them in a kind of a classroom and they asked one group to go through a load of financial stuff. They gave them all these financial questions and it was down to would you like to spend money on, you know, experiences? Would you like to spend money on going out and all this kind of stuff? Or would you like to save and invest? And the two groups were asked the very, very same questions. And what they did, though, is at, on, in front of everybody in group number one, they had a photograph of that person today. So the person is sitting at a desk. They're writing the answers to these questions. And there's a photograph of them in front of them on the desk so they can see themselves as they currently look and they filled out these answers now the other group uh, in this experiment those people were asked the exact same questions sitting down at the same classroom kind of table but the photograph had been uh, basically a filter had been applied like you see nowadays on social media where you can make yourself look old and what they did was they they aged this person by you know 30 or 40 years so that they looked like they're in their 60s balding you know wrinkles all that kind of stuff so they're asking the two groups um, the exact same questions one group 
has got the photograph of them today in front of them. And the other group, exact same questions, but the photograph has been digitally aged so that they look much, much older. They've got gray hair, wrinkles, all that kind of stuff. And so they look like they're in their 60s. Now, what was really interesting was afterwards, when they started to go through the answers, they found that all of these young people who were asked questions about what they would like to allocate their money to, uh, whether it was experiences and all this or investments and savings, the people who had the photograph of themselves today all went for investment on themselves today, experiences, all that kind of stuff. The people that had the older photograph in front of them, reminding them that they're getting older, they all went for a greater amount of investment and a greater amount of saving. And so it does show you that there's this kind of subconscious thing happening in your brain, which is telling you that, oh, that I should be looking out for this person in the future. And that was the reminder. Now, this is something that have a think about whenever you're trying to save money for a deposit on a house or whenever you're, you know, you come into a windfall if you've, you know, made some money on a property or something like that. Think about future self. Don't think about yourself right today because you will, temptation more often than not, will get the better of you. And uh, there you go. So I knew I'd be able to loop, loop this back to property. Guys, I hope you found this one interesting and useful. Sorry I deviated from the plan, but um, I hope you thought, I hope you found the procrastination thing interesting. This was really, I did this for myself because I find this very, very interesting, but I hope some of you found it useful. Now, before I go, please do check out the course. Um, I'm going to put a link in the show notes below or in the note in the description below if you're watching on YouTube. So do go and check that out. And uh, hopefully a couple of you will be interested in that new course. Until next week, I'll speak to you again soon. Take care. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Behind the Facade. If you have any questions or topics you'd like me to cover in future episodes, please connect with me via the Facebook group that is called Behind the Facade Community. Alternatively, you will find me on social media. My handle is Gavin J. Gallagher. You can stay up to date with all of my content and the various projects I'm working on over on my website, GavinJGallagher.com. And while you're there, please do add your name to the Join My Tribe thing over on the right-hand side. This will ensure you're kept up to date via my weekly newsletter. All of these links are in the show notes below. That's all for now. I will see you guys in the next episode.